Welcome back to Vitamins in Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to go over the function of ascorbate. You are probably most likely to hearing about ascorbate referred to as vitamin C. Vitamin C is one of the most important antioxidants that we have in the entire body. And, in fact, the mechanism of ant uh, free radical scavenging is shown up here. Okay, now a little bit of brief intro on ascorbate. Ascorbate is synthesized by most animals. Okay, it's synthesized by plants. It, however, is not synthesized by upper hierarchy primates, and that includes humans. All right, it turns out that, like, like for every uh, biological molecule, there is a biosynthetic pathway. And humans have all the enzymes needed to synthesize ascorbate, except for whatever reason, the last one, the last enzyme that would convert the uh, penultimate molecule into ascorbate. We, for whatever reason, don't have that enzyme expressed. It turns out that that gene for that enzyme is transcriptionally inactivated. So there's no way we can make the enzyme needed to do the final conversion of the penultimate molecule in the pathway to ascorbate, okay? Which means that for humans and certain other higher level primates, ascorbate is an essential nutrient, meaning we have to get it through the diet. We can't make it. However, most animals and plants certainly can synthesize vitamin C de novo. They can make it from scratch. And you might notice that vitamin C, unlike some of the other vitamins that we've looked at, has a bunch of oxygens and hydroxyl groups and so on and so forth. Um, vitamin C is what we would call uh, a water-soluble vitamin. A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble vitamins, but ascorbate is the first water-soluble one that we're going to look at, okay? And most of the B-series vitamins are also water-soluble. But here's the mechanism of scavenging of, elect of free electrons by ascorbate. There's normally an OH, but it's deprotonated, so this oxygen has a negative charge, and one of these, ultimately, electrons can actually be um, donated to a radical like this, whatever this radical X happens to be. And when it donates this electron, you see one electron right here on this oxygen because it just gave one up. Now this X has an extra one and the radical is quenched. Whenever we say a radical is quenched, what we mean is that the radical has been tied up in so much resonance that it basically is so much delocalized that it becomes inactive. All right, It's not reactive at all anymore. Because notice I can tie this radical up in resonance all the way up to this oxygen. There's multiple atoms by which it's distributed over, which drastically reduces its reactivity and overall energy. So by tying up the radical here in ascorbate, you've essentially neutralized it. It's not going to really react with anything. And that makes ascorbate a very important radical scavenger and important for overall health. All right. It turns out that we have um, some enzymes here um, that are very important in what we call ascorbate metabolism. One of the most important enzymes in ascorbate metabolism is ascorbate peroxidase, okay? Ascorbate peroxidase does one thing, but it can do it in multiple ways. Ascorbate peroxidase always takes one electron away from ascorbate or any ascorbate derivative, okay? So if, if ascorbate peroxidase was to react with completely neutral ascorbate, okay, which is basically the ascorbate shown right here, it has no radicals, Ascorbate peroxidase could actually catalyze this same reaction shown right here. It could take this ascorbate and convert it into the ascorbyl radical, okay, which the ascorbyl radical is shown right here. If ascorbate peroxidase reacts with the ascorbyl radical, it's going to convert it to dehydroascorbate, okay. So if you wanted to do a conversion of this form of ascorbate to this one right here, you'd need two reactions of ascorbate peroxidase. So ascorbate peroxidase takes one electron away from an ascorbate derivative and oxidizes it essentially by one electron, okay? Now, one reason ascorbate peroxidase is important is because generally most cells, when they uptake ascorbate, they can only uptake it in the totally oxidized form, also known as a dehydroascorbate. They can only uptake it in this form, and as soon as they take it in, they can reconvert it back to uh, this form shown right here, which is essentially the form shown right here, all right? So they'll intake it in this form and then convert it back to this form. The way they convert it to the totally reduced form is by dehydroascorbate dehydrogenase, which is a glutathione oxidizing enzyme 
uh, it essentially gets the electrons from glutathione and reduces dehydroascorbate to ascorbate or ascorbic acid. Okay? So let's summarize these as follows. Ascorbate peroxidase transfers one electron out of an ascorbate derivative. Thus, it either converts ascorbate to the ascorbyl radical or the ascorbyl radical to dehydroascorbate. Okay? It's one successive electron at a time per reaction. The second one, dehydroascorbate dehydrogenase or reductase, converts dehydroascorbate back to ascorbate, which is a two electron transfer. Ascorbate peroxidase is a one electron transfer, and this one is a two electron transfer. All right? All right. So here's some more on ascorbate metabolism. If the ascorbyl radical does not get immediately oxidized by ascorbate peroxidase, meaning if you let two of these sit for any length of time that's, it's actually not a long period of time, they can actually spontaneously undergo disproportionation with each other. A disproportionation is when two molecules react with each other, generally the same molecule, where one of them gets oxidized and one of them gets reduced. Well, if you have two ascorbyl radicals, one might donate the electron to the other, in which case you get ascorbate and dehydroascorbate. This is a non-enzymatic reaction. So if you let two ascorbyl radicals near each other for any amount of time, this reaction spontaneously can happen. You'll get ascorbate and dehydroascorbate. Okay? So that's the, their disproportionation reaction. Reaction. All right. This is sort of what we call the ascorbate electron transport chain. It's, it's a flow of electrons that kind of shows how things occur. Now keep in mind, ascorbate is the major free is one of the major free radical scavengers in the blood. I say this, it, it is a major one, it is not the most major. In fact, the most major in humans is actually uric acid, um, something that's not really that intuitive, but uric acid is the primary scavenger of free radicals in the blood. Ascorbate's a close second though. All right? So here's what's going to happen for this chain to work. Glutathione monomers are going to get reoxidized back to glutathione disulfides by this enzyme dehydroascorbate reductase, which by the way is the same as dehydroascorbate dehydrogenase. Okay? It's going to take the electrons away from glutathione to oxidize those, but it's going to reduce dehydroascorbate into regular ascorbate. Okay? Now, ascorbate can then react with ascorbate peroxidase to form MDA. Now what is MDA? DHA is dehydroascorbate. MDA is monodehydroascorbate, but this is the same thing. MDA is the ascorbyl radical. Remember, ascorbate peroxidase takes one electron, not two, from ascorbate. So if ascorbate reacts with ascorbate peroxidase, you're going to get the ascorbyl radical. The reason that this DHA is shown right here is, remember, the ascorbyl radicals can undergo disproportionation with each other to give DHA dehydroascorbate and ascorbic acid. All right? But also remember that ascorbate peroxidase uses hydrogen peroxide as a substrate, in which case it gets ultimately reduced to water. Okay? So this is sort of a summary of all the connected pieces here. On one end, we have hydrogen peroxide and NADPH, but we also have some glutathione players that help interconvert the three forms of ascorbate. Okay? Now, like I said, ascorbate only enters into cells through the form dehydroascorbate. All right? And once dehydroascorbate is in the cell, dehydroascorbate reductase or dehydrogenase can reconvert it to the totally reduced ascorbic acid form. All right? But ascorbate, or dehydroascorbate I should really say, enters the cell through GLUT1 and GLUT3 transporters. All right? These are glucose transporters that have a little bit of a, a broader specificity and they can actually transport the dehydroascorbate into the cell. Okay? One other really important thing in humans and most mammals is a lot of these conversions um, that are done with ascorbate actually occur in the peroxisome. Okay? The peroxisome is the major site of hydrogen peroxide catabolism. Certainly we know peroxisome has a lot of catalase in it, but one of the things that the hydrogen peroxide can react with other than catalase is it can actually react with ascorbate peroxidase. So if you have a lot of peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, in the peroxisome, obvious reasons, then this would be a good place to actually carry out ascorbate metabolism and transformations. It just makes sense that way. And remember one thing I said, ascorbate is a major free radical scavenger in the blood. It is not the most major. The most major is uric acid, and we're sure enough going to talk about that in either the next video or one after. All right? So make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.